Um, all right, Nathan and Javier are going to pick up the papers, the midterms that are still out there, and bring them in. And if you haven't got your midterm back from them yet, you should approach them during the break or after class and you can get them. Um, just to explain the grading on the midterm, uh, for purposes of grading, each of the essays was worth a potential 20 points. That adds up to 40 points, obviously, for the two of them. The midterm is worth 20% of your final grade. So in order to figure out what portion of that 20% you have earned with your midterm, you simply take the average of the two scores that you have for your individual essays, okay? Um, we are going to put together a distribution so that you can get a sense of how you did compared to everyone else. Um, I don't have that ready to go yet, but we will put that together and distribute it probably by email or just post it on vSpace. Um, the initial word I get from the GSIs is that the average score for essays, for each essay individually, um, was somewhere in the ballpark of 17 and a half out of 20. So if you got like a 35 combined between the two, you probably did about average compared to everyone else in the class. Um, but I, don't hold me to that because I haven't actually crunched the numbers in detail yet. Are there any questions about that? Okay, how many exams do you still have in your hands? Quite a few, okay. Again, if you haven't got your midterm yet and you want to get it today, you can approach the GSIs. All right, um, so this is Geography 130, lecture number 17. I wanted to start by um, going back a little bit more patiently to <clears throat> the last couple of slides from Tuesday. Um, and again, I appreciate your putting up with the ridiculous numbers of slides that were shown that I attempted to get through last time. Um, today, it's still quite a few, but it's more reasonable than it was on Tuesday. I wanted to, to just sort of, and this works as a kind of introduction to Kloppenberg as well, which is the focus of the rest of the lecture. I wanted to recapitulate some of the conclusions reached last time on the question of the state and its relationship to nature. Um, if you've done the Kloppenberg reading, this will resonate with Kloppenberg. In many ways, this formulation, um, I owe this formulation in some measure to Kloppenberg's book. But I, I think this also works with Worcester, although Worcester does not attempt to formulate it this way because he's principally a historian and he's not trying to answer questions about social theory. Um, so the state and nature, trying to think about the state as a kind of shock absorber, both for people and also for investments. In other words, um, trying to take care of people and trying to protect the investments that people and firms have made in the face of various kinds of shocks or threats that come from nature or have a kind of, or manifest themselves through the environment. So natural disasters is one obvious example. The Dust Bowl might be considered a kind of natural disaster, even if it was the result of human actions. Environmental pollution and degradation would be another one. Um, valued components or sites of nature. Um, there, off the top of my head, I'm, I'm drawing a blank as to what my own examples would be for that. Diseases, and I mean, we could have a general discussion about this. It seems to me pretty obvious that when shocks come to our society that have a kind of, they, they are either obviously or um, Obviously, the acts of God, so to speak, you know, whether it's Hurricane Katrina, whether it's, um, you know, swine flu outbreak, um, earthquakes, even if it's a pest outbreak that affects an agricultural region, we expect the state to step up. When the state failed to step up properly following Hurricane Katrina, it had a huge effect on people's confidence in the federal government, confidence in the Bush administration. Um, it's, we were quite startled or shocked when the state fails to step up to these kinds of challenges. And it's interesting um, that even, even people who normally argue that the government should not get involved in the economy or in providing welfare. Um, even those people expect that if a hurricane or an earthquake devastates a large area affecting a lot of people, that you know FEMA, the federal government, state governments, the National Guard um, will, will step in and handle the crisis. And this is, this is perhaps most conspicuous in cases of crisis, but it's also there in much more sort of banal or everyday ways um, when it comes to a lot of things having to do with managing nature. Um, we expect the government to provide flood control. We expect the government to, for the most part, provide clean water for us to drink. Um, the government has an obvious role in maintaining standards of air quality, water quality, building codes. Um, there are all kinds of ways in which when it comes to the natural environment and also the built environment, um, it's, a, it's almost a given across the political spectrum that the government will play some kind of role in maintaining standards and mitigating harm. Now, and this, this next slide speaks to the ways in which um, we also expect the state to engineer and produce these built environments, um, maintain them. The built environment of the Western United States is extraordinary in this regard. The ways in which the government has provided, um, made enormous investments in the landscape um, to control floods and provide water both for farmers and for cities, um, to pr protect us against floods, to provide the highways and other infrastructures through which we um, move through the landscape. These are all areas in which we, generally speaking, expect the government to um, play a role. What is that role? How would we characterize that role? Um, and I want to suggest that it actually is more, it's more, it's not only a question of engineering the environment, it's also a question of providing a kind of ideological rationale for the government. In other words, we come to count on this built environment. Um, we come to see it as natural, in a sense. And to that extent, we come to see the government's role in providing it as natural. And it's, in many ways, a, a great legitimating role for the government to play, for the government to essentially um, naturalize its rule or its authority um, through the medium of providing a second nature for us to live within and ensuring that that second nature will be safe, will be available, will be reliable, that kind of thing. Um, and then also, and this again speaks to sort of banal things, um, things that most of us most of the time probably barely even notice, and that is the collecting and analysis of information about the environment, um, about natural resources, whether it's weather data, maps, surveys, the geological survey, um, data about the market. We see there's an interesting anal analog or, or overlap between the government's role in monitoring and reporting about the environment and its role in monitoring and reporting about the market. And I would suggest that the two have a kind of mutually legitimating effect. Um, we need this information, or this information is valuable to, if not all of us, then many of us. And 
the notion that the government can be counted on to collect the data in a reliable way to provide it to people, um, maybe all people, or at least those people who are interested in it, um, that it can be counted on for a certain kind of objectivity. All of these things suggest further ways in which the state and nature um, intermingle with each other and um, come to play complementary roles, both practically and ideologically. Um, one of you came up afterwards and said, where, where did you get this? And I was like, well, you know, this sort of patched together from lots of different examples, um, attempting to make sense of Worcester, make sense of Plattenberg, but also make sense of all kinds of other instances in which um, the state plays a very prominent role in monitoring, regulating, controlling, engineering, um, repairing the environment that we live in, both natural and built. So this, which I showed last time, uh, at the bottom it says, profitable activities are private, unprofitable ones are the state. If we picture, um, this can be, you know, you can imagine this as rainfall in, in agricultural settings. You can also imagine it as swings in the economy in general, um, whether it's the housing market or others. Um, this has been abundantly demonstrated in the last couple of years, that when the, when the economy goes off the rails and large numbers of people face huge economic losses, or perhaps small numbers of people face huge economic losses, um, the government is the, is the sort of provider of last resort and steps in to at least tie things over, absorb losses, or spread them out in such a way that they are not so severe in their impact on individuals and firms. Meanwhile, once the market returns to strength, um, it's, again, abundantly demonstrated already that the, part, the private parties expect the government to back away and let the private profit making resume once things have improved. Um, so then I talked about the Agalala Didn't get to these conclusions. Um, before we go there, are there any questions about that? Anybody want to talk about that? Do you question do you, when, when when an earthquake strikes or a hurricane strikes and suddenly the president is flying around in a helicopter above you um, and all these government people are throwing money and people at, at the situation, does it, does it occur to you that this is odd? If the government fails to do this, would it surprise you? This is, yeah? Uh, interstate commerce. Well, it's interesting because a lot of these, these activities of the federal government in the United States um, are 20th century creations, right? And did build very much on an expansion of federal government activities and powers um, that did begin in many ways with the Interstate Commerce Clause of the Constitution, which basically said if there's anything going on between the states, such as trade or navigation of rivers, then the federal government has an authorized role under the Constitution to be involved with that. But you think about the public lands of the Western United States in the year 1900, um, the expectation among most people was that the federal government would get out of those lands eventually, would dispose of them and let the private market and the states have jurisdiction over them. Did you have something? Okay. I don't wish to suggest that it's odd, except in a very sort of historical sense or, or sociological sense. In other words, um, yes, it seems, it seems like the right thing. It seems to, normal or expectable, um, but it's also something that requires some degree of explanation. And I, I guess I think it's, it's interesting to think about it um, in terms of nature sort of forcing these issues sometimes. The, the issue basically being that there are things that we are all collectively affected by um, and that no individual can really control or respond to. And that to that extent, it, it provides a natural terrain in which the state can exercise its activities and, and demonstrate its legitimacy. Okay. That's a great point. That's a very good point. That as capitalism develops and you see these kinds of very, very expensive investments made, whether they're made by the public through the government or made by private firms, um, concentrated in discrete locations, um, that is an investment that, if it is threatened, represents a potential impact um, not only to the owners but to the people who rely on them. And that as that increases, the necessity of the government to be prepared and capable of managing threats to those investments um, rises accordingly. I mean, and if you look at the development of water provisioning in the Western U.S., it's very much a story in which um, private capital and states were not did not have the resources necessary to do things like build the Hoover Dam um, and construct the kinds of systems that were ne needed. And the federal government stepped in in many ways after everyone else had tried and failed and managed to sort of get everyone's assent to an increased federal presence on the grounds that this was necessary and nobody else could do it. Any other thoughts? Okay, so this is, this is a, a sort of general theory about the state and its relationship to the environment that I would encourage you to um, think about and um, help me improve it. I'm sure that there are ways in which it can be improved. Um, some conclusions that I had to ask you to read last time about Worcester's book and the Dust Bowl, that Great Plains agriculture was driven not by genes or evolution, I would add also not just by some um, nebulous category culture, but by capital. In other words, um, the the investments in the railroads and the farms and the tractors and the other systems necessary to make it profitable to grow crops in the, dust, in the Great Southern Great Plains um, made, well, made it possible and drove it forward. It was a profit-seeking system um, of enormous power, and it was poorly suited to the variability that it encountered in the Southern Great Plains, and that created a crisis. It was dependent on the state in many ways, including research and information and knowledge about the area and about things like soils and crops and climates, about um, dependent on it for minimizing and absorbing risks or losses for long-term and large-scale investments, and in, in a sense to protect capitalism from itself in the Southern Great Plains. And in some respects, this is, by the time you get to the end of the book, this is Worcester's sort of point of his meditation. He's, he's thinking to himself, you know, this could have had a different outcome. The, the Southern Great Plains could have adopted a more um, collective or communal and less profit-motivated, less individualistic um, approach to living in the region, but it didn't. And the reason it could get away with not doing that, he suggests, is precisely because the government stepped in and played these various roles. In other words, investments in the built environment, both physical and financial, exerted an inertial force economically and politically. Once those investments were made, um, it was very difficult to get around them, to get away from them, to absorb them and put something else in their place. The time horizon of private investment tends to be short relative to many important ecological processes. There's a mismatch of temporal scales. So the time horizon of the debt, funding, financing tractors and farms in the Southern Great Plains was 
on the order of maybe five years, 10 years, 20 years at most, whereas the cycles of drought in the Southern Great Plains operate on 20-year timescales um, and are highly unpredictable. They, they control the sort of long-term viability of agriculture there, um, but they operate on different scales. And finally, that the U.S. state tends to supplement and support private capital by absorbing risks and making long-term investments that are, um, by their nature, not profitable on shorter timescales. All right, so that wrapped up that lecture. Any closing thoughts, concluding thoughts? Did you like Worcester? Yeah? Good. Now let's talk about Kloppenberg. Did you like Kloppenberg? Um, this, again, is a much longer book. There's a lot more of it that you're, I encourage you to read. Um, I'm going to try to hit as many of these points as I can today. Again, um, summarizing not only the portion of the book that I ask you to read, but also his larger argument. So we're going to run quickly through commodifying the seed, public seed improvement and the division of research labor, germplasm and the world system, the green revolution, and genetic engineering. We'll see how far we get. So Kloppenberg's book, the subtitle, Political Economy of Plant Biotechnology, 1492 to, what is it, 2000? He, he wants to look at plant biotechnology in relation to political economy and commodification, in relation to institutions and the division of labor, and in relation to the world economy and germplasm transfer. And when he says plant biotechnology, he's not only talking about what we think of now as biotech. He's not talking only about genetic engineering, um, except insofar as you could say that older methods of engineering plant germplasm um, are, are, do in fact exist, have existed for many, many millennia. Um, the, the, the practice is basically simple. It has to do with farmers selecting seeds from their crop every year to hold and replant the following year. And they typically do this based on the performance they see in the year that they're harvesting. They know that they need seed for the following year, and they typically are going to make some judgment about which plants produced the seed that they want to see more of in the future, right? If they did the plants that did best by whatever criteria they choose to apply. And this has the effect over many generations of changing the makeup of those plants themselves at, at a genetic level. And so that's the broader definition of plant biotechnology that he's interested in considering. He does this through a Marxian lens focusing on primitive accumulation and commodification. He defines primitive accumula accumulation as the separation of the worker from the means of production. This is very similar to Adam Smith's notion of the appropriation of land and Marx's notion of the creation of a class of wage laborers. And he starts from a kind of conundrum. How do you apply this to family farming? If the British, or I'm sorry, the Jeffersonian sort of American ideal of a yeoman farmer is a farmer who farms at the family scale and owns his or her own land, how can you possibly consider that person to be part of the proletariat? They're not wage laborers. They own their means of production. They own their farm. To that extent, how can you possibly evaluate this using such Marxian terms and concepts? He, he poses the question that's been asked um, for at least 100 years now, does agriculture pose obstacles to capitalist social relations? Are there, are there intrinsic features of agriculture that make it resistant to the standard model of capitalist production in which you have owners of the means of production on one side and laborers on the other? The family farm would appear to provide evidence that maybe indeed this is the case. To the extent that farming in the United States anyway has not become entirely a wage labor production sector, it would presumably suggest that the sort of standard Marxian model doesn't work. Commodification, he defines as the extension of the commodity, commodity form to new spheres. The accumulation of value through production for exchange in spheres that were previously not subject to that kind of value accumulation. And the, con the conundrum here has to do with seeds and the simple fact that seeds as biological entities have the capacity to reproduce themselves. They are both a product of farming and a means of production. They are produced when you grow a crop, you can hold on to them and use them the following year to grow another crop, and in that instance, that second round, they are a means of production. The farmer, in other words, can produce them for use as well as for exchange. Now, remember, of course, with some crops, the finished product is the seed, right? Corn or wheat are examples. In other crops, the seed is not what you're trying to sell when you sell onto the market, um, in, for example, with many fruits. But nonetheless, the seed is produced in the course of producing whatever it is you are trying to sell to the market, and you are capable of simply holding on to it. In other words, you don't have to buy it. Once you have some, you can, they will reproduce themselves. And to that extent, it would appear that the seed resists commodification. Yeah? Precisely. It's not necessarily true anymore. And that is, in many ways, what Kloppenberg is trying to explain. He's trying to explain, if these things are true, how could it become the case that the seed is a commodity? If you look back uh, as little as 100 years ago, most farmers didn't rely on the market for most of their seed. They simply held seed from the year before and replanted it. And to that extent, the seed part of the farming economy was not commodified. And in order for it to become commodified, there would need to be, in Kloppenberg's formulation, a process of primitive accumulation to make it a commodity. That's, in many ways, the story he's going to tell in this book. So here is a table from Kloppenberg, I've reproduced it, of the organic composition of capital in U.S. agriculture from 1870 to 1976. And you can see that the cost of land has remained fairly stable as a portion of the overall capital invested in agriculture, but that the uh, relative shares, respective shares of labor and capital have basically switched places. So in 1870, labor was 65% and capital was 17. In 1976, lab labor was only 16% and capital was 62%. And this is exactly the sort of formulation that we saw in Marx of the organic composition of capital here, um, provided empirically in terms of, of U.S. agriculture. So we have seen what Marx predicted, <coughs> a dramatic diminishment of the organic composition of capital in agriculture. And this, in many ways, uh, supports Kloppenberg's contention that even if it's still family farming, it has 